Authors at Google today is very pleased to invite uh, David Mendel. David Mendel is the Dibner Professor of the History of Engineering and Manufacturing at MIT. He has 25 years of experience as an engineer in the field of undersea robotic exploration, as a veteran of more than 30 oceanographic <laughs> expeditions, and more recently as an airplane pilot and engineer of autonomous aircraft. He is the award-winning author of Iron Coffin, War Technology and Experience Aboard the USS Monitor, and Digital Apollo, Human and Machine in Spaceflight, and his most recent book, Our Robots, Ourselves, was published by Viking on October 13th of this year. Please join me in welcoming David Mendel. Thank you. Thank you, Susanna, for that nice introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, and I'm going to talk about uh, my new book, uh, Robots Ourselves. I come to this book sort of out of the experience of my previous book, which was called Digital Apollo. And Digital Apollo was about the computers and the software that were used inside both the command module and the lunar module for the Apollo lunar landings in the 60s. How they were designed, how they were engineered, it was really the first embedded computer kind of the, the, certainly the first computer that software became central to human life and was life critical software. Um, and uh, one of the first real time control computers and the first digital fly by wire system. And you can see in this image over on the right, um, which is, for, is the cover image, it was made actually uh, by John Knoll, who, who you may know from Industrial Light and Magic. And um, a little bit more clearly presented here, the book focuses on this kind of climactic moment in the Apollo 11 lunar landing where the mythology went, Armstrong reaches up and turns off the computer and the last minute and lands the, the spacecraft by hand to avoid this crater that you can see there out the window, West Crater. And I, the book sort of takes that moment as a starting point for why would he turn off the computer and why was that important? And now it turns out that he didn't turn off the computer. He, he turned it from uh, a fairly highly automated targeting mode that kind of allowed him a kind of cursor control around the moon to a still fairly highly semi-automated mode, attitude hold in his right hand, rate of descent with a switch in his left hand, still very much a fly-by-wire kind of automated mode. That's actually not so far from how uh, pilots fly Airbus airliners today. He didn't turn off the computer. He moved it to a different level of automation to suit what he felt was the situation at the time. And this was a very interesting moment because I learned in the course of writing this book, at the time the Soviet spacecraft were controlled by analog computers and they were very highly automated. They left very little discretion and role for the astronauts. The American computer was a general purpose digital computer, one of the first integrated circuits, uses of integrated circuits in fact. This computer consumed 60% of the national output of integrated circuits for a couple of years during the 60s. Um, and it was, so it was a very advanced, forward-looking thing to do, including all the complexities of the software. And yet all that advanced technology did not make the machine more automated. It just made it automated in a more nuanced, uh, sophisticated way that gave the human better control over the spacecraft. And that gave me this idea, which I've then pursued throughout uh, this new book, that often um, the highest level of automation, we talk about levels of automation, is not necessarily full autonomy and the most difficult challenging technological problem is not full autonomy but rather what I come to call the perfect five, the uh, interaction, the, if you think about level one as fully manual, level ten as fully automated, um, the perfect five is really the most complicated, difficult and I think also socially and financially rewarding place to have automated systems where the, per the, the human is in control, there's trusted, transparent autonomy, and the system can be moved up and down various levels, turning things on, turning things off, in order to suit the particular situation. And what you see um, through the Apollo story and many of the stories in the book is that a lot of systems start out in the engineering phase as, as imagining full autonomy. The, the engineers on the Apollo computer thought there would only be two buttons on the interface. One would be go to moon and one would be take me home. Um, and instead, of course, what you ended up with was this very rich, um, 
uh, very carefully designed mix of instruments and controls. Um, as these systems frequently, time and time again, move from laboratory to field, there are human interventions and human controls put in at critical moments. Um, so again, I've been talking about the perfect five. So the subtitle of the book is The Myths of Autonomy. I want to read you a little bit from chapter one about what those myths are. First, there's the myth of linear progress. The idea that technology evolves from direct human involvement to remote presence and then to fully autonomous robots. Political scientist Peter Singer, you may be familiar with his book Wired for War, epitomizes this mythology when he writes that, quote, this concept of keeping the human in the loop is already being eroded by both policymakers and the technology itself, which are both moving rapidly toward pushing humans out of the loop, unquote. But there's no evidence to suggest that this is a natural evolution, that the technology itself, as Singer puts it, does any such thing. In fact, there's good evidence, a lot of it is presented in this book, that people are moving into deeper intimacy with their machines. Second is the myth of replacement, the idea that machines take over human jobs one for one. But human factors researchers and cognitive systems engineers have found that rarely does, automated, does automation simply mechanize a human task. Rather, it tends to make the task more complex, often increases the workload, or at least shifts it around. And finally, as I mentioned, we have the myth of full autonomy, the utopian idea that robots today and the future should operate entirely on their own. Yes, automation can certainly take on parts of tasks that were previously accomplished by humans. Machines do act on their own in response to their environments for certain periods of time. But the machine that operates entirely independently of human direction is a useless machine. And I used to say that only a rock is truly autonomous. But then my geologist friends reminded me that even rocks are shaped and formed by their environments. Automation changes the type of human involvement required, transforms it, but does not eliminate it. For any apparently autonomous system, you can always find the wrapper of human control that makes it useful and returns meaningful data. The questions that I'm interested in then are not man versus unmanned, human controlled versus autonomous, but rather, where are the people? Which people are they? What are they doing? and when are they doing it? And so you can trace through networks of, uh, you know, in some sense, any programming task is a kind of uh, 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 placing of human intention and human design and human views of the world into a piece of software that is later executed at some future date. So the book covers ex three, four extreme environments. Um, and the idea is that in these extreme environments, like spaceflight, people have been forced to use robotics for 30 or 40 years because in many cases it was the only way to do a job where people couldn't physically be. And we can look at those environments and see something about our robotic future in more ordinary environments like automobiles and other aspects of daily life. So I begin with the deep ocean, which is where my career began, and the move from scientists visiting the seafloor in submarines. You may be familiar with Alvin, which is a three-man submarine operated by the Oceanographic Institute at Woods Hole, where I used to work, toward remote robots. And this was the evolution that I was involved in starting in the late 80s, uh, moving into the 1990s. And we were all convinced that the world was moving from human to remote to autonomous. There's a great deal of tension over that issue. This image appeared in National Geographic in 1981 in an article uh, written by my mentor in that field, Dr. Robert Ballard, who you may know as the discoverer of the Titanic. And, and in, this, in this article, Ballard laid out this new vision for exploring the seafloor, which was remote or telepresence. And you can see there's now a ship, traditional oceanographic ship. Um, can you see that dot there? Traditional oceanographic ship on the surface a fiber optic cable, itself a rather new technology in the 1980s, then a kind of uh, basic uh, towed sled called Argo in this case, and then a little robot called Jason that would come off this vehicle and explore, in this case, the mid-ocean ridges or hydrothermal vents. 
And Ballard started a lab at Woods Hole called the Deep Emergence Lab, which spent the 80s kind of developing this particular system. Now, interestingly, before the Jason robot came online, we had just the sled Argo, and that's the thing that actually discovered the Titanic wreck in 1985. In 1986, though, um, the Woods Hole groups together went back and revisited the Titanic wreck and sent this little kind of proto-Jason called Jason Jr. Um, connected to Alvin, the three-man submarine, little robot, human vehicle, remote robot, down the grand staircase of the Titanic. Took tremendous pictures. It was here on the cover of the um, National Geographic magazine. But there was a great deal of tension, in some cases literally tension pulling on the cable, between the, the folks who operated the man submersible, Alvin, and the folks who felt that remote presence was the way of the future. In fact, I, I use these two covers because the geographic article which Ballard wrote shows only the little remote robot, doesn't deal with Alvin at all, and the Time Magazine cover, which actually Ken Marshall lives out here in LA, uh, did this painting of, um, shows only Alvin. This is why a lot of people still to this day think that Alvin discovered the Titanic, which it didn't. Um, but what you see here is a sense that that actually the human and the robotic vehicles are evolving together and kind of playing off each other in the evolution. This image, which is a family tree of undersea vehicles from Woods Hole, kind of implies by its sort of Darwinian ascent nature that you have the man submersible here, Alvin, then the remote vehicles, Jason, then this whole panoply of autonomous vehicles. I worked a little bit on Abe, I talk about in the book, the Remus vehicles are the ones that discovered the uh, wreck of the Air France uh, crash that I also discuss in the book, um, moving toward this level of higher and higher autonomy. But at the top of this is vehicles that are called hybrid ROVs. They are sometimes remote and they're sometimes autonomous. And so the, the real evolution is actually, if anything, a kind of convergence and a blurring of the lines between what's a human operated vehicle, what's a remote vehicle, and what's a um, uh, autonomous vehicle. These are a few different images from some of my colleagues at Woods Hole about what the kind of currently engineered future of oceanography looks like. Here you have what we used to think of as an autonomous vehicle. Send it off the ship, it'll go down like an autonomous robot, run a bunch of track lines, keep some algorithms, do some mapping, and come back. But of course, as those vehicles evolved, they um, uh, developed acoustic technologies to stay in touch with what's on the ship. And every expedition you go on is really a collaboration between a manned vehicle, a ship, and an autonomous vehicle. And you send the, the uh, uh, robotic system out in the morning. It maybe comes back a day or two later, exchanges energy for information, talks to its human overlords a little bit, goes back out, does it again. And you have this kind of constantly going out and coming back. And the autonomy is actually pretty well bounded in time. And there's always, again, this kind of wrapper of go out, do this, come back. Um, sometimes they just run straight track lines. But simply getting the vehicle in, in you know, six miles of water to go out and do something and return is an amazing feat of technology. Requires all kinds of subtlety in the software and, and uh, algorithms and uh, uh, system design and whatnot. Um, but the challenge is to keep it under control. I'll read you a little passage from the book about my experience with the remote vehicles and how it transformed the presence that we experienced. On a summer day in 1988, two years after the Titanic exploration, I walked down the stairs of an old green aluminum building in Woods Hole called the Deep Submergence Laboratory. I was, looking th I was there looking for a job straight out of college, and I was there to meet a man named Skip Marquet, one of the original designers of Alvin and the co-founder of the Deep Submergence Lab with Bob Ballard. Touring around this lab, I saw exotic robots, heavy pressure housings, and other things foreign to me. This thing's been inside the Titanic, Marquet said, as he pointed out, Jason Jr. Opened up on a lab bench with its electronic guts spilled out. But inside the robots and surrounding them were things that were deeply familiar to me. Electronics, microprocessors, software manuals. And in a moment, I was hooked. I could bring my interest in electronics and my engineering degree to this unusual alien adventure. Um, I was eager, eager to travel the world doing engineering and build electronics that would find their way into extreme environments and not have to report to work in a cubicle. 
I joined the Jeep's Emergence Lab as a junior engineer. What was it like then to operate a remote robot in the deep ocean? First of all, we should qualify the term robot. The term was commonly used for the vehicle, but there was very little resembling autonomy about it. In fact, it was something of a blank slate, technically speaking. There was relatively little computing power on board, only enough to flick the lights and instruments on and off, turn on the thrusters, and do some local housekeeping. The video and most of the instrumentation signals went straight up the optical fibers and was multiplexed through the computer to go to the top for processing. Even when Jason was doing something automatic, such as holding its own constant depth, the feedback loops were usually closed up on the surface on a, through a computer on the ship. Jason's control room, though, consisted of five or six 27-inch video monitors mounted on the wall, displaying imagery from the multiple cameras' navigation data. A series of control stations were arranged beneath them, one for the pilot, one for an engineer. A data logger changed the videotapes. This left plenty of room in the van for a chief scientist who usually sat behind the pilot to direct the dive. Then 20, 10 or 20 other people, other scientists, engineers, graduate students, and film teams from the media. When all was stable, the whole control van would become concentrated on the seafloor. Now that's the world of telepresence, the pilot Martin Bowen would said. That's where I forget about my body and I project myself into the ocean floor and have to make that vehicle dance. The pilots learned to narrow their attention to hear just a few voices. If the compass didn't look right or the surface weather was flaring up, the pilot could ask the navigator about it. I tended to stand the navigation watch and I learned to anticipate much of what the pilot needed and when he needed it move the ship a bit, change the navigation quality, watch out, you're getting a little bit close to this. I just started mapping things in my own head, Martin Bowen said, what the obstacles are, how I need to fly, how low. I have the advantage of being surrounded by people who are also helping to take care. So our presence on the seafloor deeply related to what was going on in that darkened control room. As Jason pinged and photographed its ray around shipwreck sites or hydrothermal vents or other places, the group in the control room was in constant conversation, observing, questioning, speculating on what the cameras and sensors showed. This constant real-time seminar about the ongoing exploration, combined with the beautiful haunting images we were seeing on the monitors, is what transported us into this other world. It was the most fundamental surprising difference from Alvin, where even though you were physically near that other world, you only had two people plus the pilot talking to each other. So the rest of the book goes through a series of similar experiences in other environments. Um, I mentioned the undersea environment with both remote and autonomous vehicles. There's a chapter on space where I talk about the, the groups who use the Mars Exploration Rovers, not too far from here, up at JPL, and how there, even though they're experiencing a 20 minute time delay from when they get their signals to when they uh, originated on Mars and a much longer time delay to issue a command and see a response, they still over time develop an immensely intense feeling of presence on the red planet and they feel like they are present in the landscape. The robots up there are not doing any geology on their own. They're remote controlled from the ground, they have certain autonomous features that are used at certain times, but they build a picture on the ground, in this case as much through you know, large-scale paper maps as through uh, computer screens um, that the group on the ground can kind of explore together. Similar stories about the repairs of the Hubble Space Telescope. There were five missions over a 15-year period that conducted those repairs. Beautiful choreographed dance between humans, robots, all networked through these kind of extended networks. There's a chapter on the uh, Predator, the uh, remotely piloted aircraft that the Air, Air Force uses um, both for persistent surveillance, real-time video in Iraq and Afghanistan and elsewhere, and also for firing missiles and shooting people. Um, and what you found there is very similar to what we had experienced in the Jason control room. Their, their bodies, the operators of Predator, are physically removed from the battlefield, but their experience of warfare is actually very, very intense partly because they're doing what aircraft pilots who are literally above the battlefield don't do. The Predator pilots will circle for hours. They have a camera on a single 
farmhouse or compound or uh, you know, social organization. And because of the social relationships they form through the networks, sometimes with friendly forces on the ground who they're trying to support, otherwise, other times with people who they're surveilling and potentially attacking, there's still social relationships, gives them a very intense feeling of presence. And in fact, the predator operators experience post-traumatic stress disorder at about the same rate that the Air, uh, Air Force airplane pilots do, which is remarkable considering they're physically not at risk. And it's very, very complicated conversation, I'm sure you've read about it in the media, going on within the Air Force about are these people warriors, do they deserve medals, do they deserve combat pay, um, there's very high rates of burnout, um, it's a very kind of unsettling, uh, I hate to use this word, but disruptive experience for the people involved. Similar story ab aboard airliners, uh, where I talk about um, how uh, in some airlines, pilots are actually, uh, and the airlines themselves, are backing away from highly automated systems like Autoland, which will land an air airplane without the pilot touching the controls, but it's a fairly brittle kind of high stress situation um, in favor of things like heads-up displays where um, in any kind of weather, in any kind of situation, the pilot always does the same procedures and is given a flight path vector and a guidance cue um, overlaid on the actual runway or where the runway will be if you can't see it for weather and lands that way. Very much dependent on software, very highly automated, integrated technological system, but the perception and the motor coordination are still going through the human body. And, and actually, interestingly, the um, space shuttle had an auto land system um, that our taxpayer dollars all paid for. It was never used. Um, pilots never, just like the, the, uh, the, the lunar landing pilots, didn't like the idea or could never even tested the auto land system on the shuttle. But they had the same uh, guidance cues and flight path vectors in their heads-up display, which were actually generated by the auto land, but instead of the auto land operating the, the flight controls directly, it sort of went through the cognition and the body of the, of the commander of the mission and flew it by joystick following those cues. So one of the things you see is all autonomous systems, this is actually a quote from a DOD report in 2012, all autonomous systems are joint human-machine cognitive systems. There are no fully autonomous systems, just as there are no fully autonomous sailors, soldiers, airmen, or marines. And you can extend that into the civilian wor world as there are no autonomous pilots, uh, drivers, other things. Everybody's embedded in a network. There's always these kinds of trades of autonomy, particularly depending on things like spatial positioning, bandwidth, what kind of networks you're in. Those things vary over time. So I want to read you a more modern story from the world of um, oceanography about autonomous vehicles to show you how this played out. James Kinsey, a young engineering scientist at the Deep Submergence Lab, 20 years after I started working there, came to the job, came to the job with great plans for the autonomy he planned to bestow on his vehicles. He began to build up probabilistic models of how the hydrothermal vent plumes propagate through the ocean and to try to instruct the vehicles to follow minute detections from their sensors down to the vents. Over time, however, Kinsey realized that trying to imbue that much autonomy into the vehicle was likely a problem from the beginning. Because of the nature of oceanographic exploration, the tasks are poorly defined and the environment is always changing. Anything programmed into the vehicle constituted assumptions, models about how the world worked that might be valid, might not be valid in a new context where the people could see more. I think it focused on the wrong aspects of autonomy, perhaps, Kinsey told me. You're requiring the vehicle to understand a lot of context that may not be available to it. Kinsey had his own version of the surprise that I had talked about in a previous chapter, experienced by space engineers as the abstractions of autonomy from a kind of design and research phase met real applications. One of the problems with having a, making, having a vehicle that makes its own decisions, Kinsey realized, is, quote, there's a certain amount of opaqueness to what it's doing. Even if you're monitoring it, 
you say, gee, it just suddenly wandered off to the southwest. Southwest. Is that a malfunction or is it part of the decision tree? Operating in the deep ocean is expensive and autonomous vehicles, even though they're unmanned, are far from disposable. Kinsey observes, people like to know where their stuff is, especially when they pay a lot of money for it. Overall in the ocean, the lines between human, remote, and autonomous vehicles are blurring. Engineers envision now an ocean with many vehicles working in concert. Some may contain people, others will be remote or autonomous. All will be capable of shifting modes at any given time. Alvin recently had an upgrade and the new software was actually originally designed for autonomous vehicles. The ch challenges are to coordinate all these machines, keep the humans informed, and ensure that the robot's actions reflect human intentions. Some will operate through high bandwidth channels like optical fibers, others through more constrained channels. Some will cl circle close to a node to flash up their data, then slide back into the abyss. Each will do as it's told and make some decisions on its own, according to structures imbued by its human programmers. In this world under sea, but also on land, we can imagine autonomy as a strangely shaped three-dimensional cloud with vehicles constantly moving back and forth across its boundaries. Now imagine that one of these vehicles is your car and the 3D cloud of autonomy is your neighborhood. At certain times, in certain places, the car has some kinds of autonomy. Stay within a highway lane or drive in a high-speed convoy. At other times, such as if you're far from a cell tower or driving in snow and the ice obscures the car's sensors, the autonomous capabilities are reduced and the driver must be more involved. You drive in and out of the cloud, delicately switching in and out of automatic modes. So what does this mean for engineering? I'm an engineer as well as a scholar and um, I like to think that, that all of this work tells us something about how to build autonomous systems. One of them is this. I've interviewed a lot of airline pilots and I've asked every single one of them, have you ever asked this question? And every single one of them says, yes. In fact, one of them said, oh, that's only, that's only what the new guys say, what's it doing now? The experienced people say, oh, it does that sometimes. <laughs> and so um, I've been involved with a, a partner of mine, a company called Aurora Flight Sciences, building full-size autonomous vehicles for big research projects. And one of them was this program called ACUS, uh, which was a, a full-size autonomous cargo helicopter designed to, to travel to deliver cargo to some remote area without putting a human pilot at risk. Um, but again, there's always a wrapper of human uh, activity around any autonomous system. And in this case, part of that wrapper was the people who needed the supplies, right? There's no reason to go somewhere if you don't have something to bring someone. And so there's a marine landing support specialist on the ground. And now we were required by ONR, this person is not a pilot, should not have a kind of flight control station, um, and should be able to, to work with the system with only 15 minutes of training. So we talked to these folks and we said, how would you like it if we could build an autonomous cargo helicopter that has a LIDAR that could come in and find a landing zone and land where you want your supplies? And they all, all of them had experience in Iraq and Afghanistan, and they said, oh my goodness, no way. Horrifying, terrifying. Uh, to have a 10-ton Black, Black Hawk helicopter bearing down on you at 100 knots, not fun, right? They said, you have no idea how scary it is to be in a combat zone and see unmanned aircraft flying around when you don't know whose they are, what their intentions are, what they're doing. Even if they're friendly, they're scary. Um, so we had to build a system that had a kind of situated or embedded autonomy where the, the people on the ground could at least have some basic kind of state control of the, the aircraft. The simplest one is if it's coming in and it actually has a LIDAR on it, you can just see some of these um, operational modes here. Here's the helicopter scanning the terrain and um, choosing a landing zone. Um, but maybe the landing zone the helicopter chooses is not one that's acceptable to the person on the ground or vice versa. So you have about a minute to do a kind of little negotiation, do this, do that. And the aircraft have to, has to be able to respond in ways that the human finds predictable, understandable, and that basically means relatively simple. What we ended up with in this case was actually designing the kind of core state machine for the autonomous system 
um, in this case it was in MATLAB state flow, um, to have these kind of macro states of autonomy that were very simple, very well understood, very predictable, and then kind of auto-coding both the user interface and the core autonomy mission manager out of that to give the system a, a very kind of predictable look and feel to the, the person. There's a few things they could command the helicopter to do. Go away, abort, you know, circle for a little while, choose another zone, um, and it had to be, there were a lot of complex algorithms buried in each of those states, but the states had to be relatively simple and straightforward. The fly-off for that vehicle was in 2014, went very well. We beat Lockheed Martin at, at that game, and the, that program is now progressing into other phases. We're very proud of our work on it. And yet, when it was reported in the Wall Street Journal, this was the headline, Navy drones with a mind of their own, right? And so there's still a great kind of public narrative of, you know, Star Wars-y, 20th century science fiction, the drones are coming to kill us kinds of things. Um, despite the fact that the people who are closest to it on the front lines, that's the last thing they want. I'll just briefly close with another um, a program that we're working on. This is a DARPA program called Alias, where the assignment is really to build a kind of robot that sits in the co-pilot seat. Um, not really a robotic co-pilot because you actually end up changing the roles of both the, ro the pilot and the co-pilot. Um, and, and then can either convert an existing aircraft into a remotely piloted aircraft or can kind of help a single pilot um, and kind of, uh, it's really one of the terms people use these days, is a co-robot that allows support and help but still keeps the human in the loop. Very challenging um, program from a bunch of different points of view, but one of them that I think is the most worthwhile is learning how to build a system that's truly collaborative um, and allows the pilot to sort of go through checklists and different procedures. This program was written up by John Markoff in the New York Times this summer, uh, a machine in the co-pilot seat. Um, there's a kind of prototype of it that Aurora has already made called Centaur, which is a, an optionally piloted aircraft. It can be flown by a human pilot like a traditional aircraft. It can be remotely operated from the ground station or the mode that I think is the coolest, you can fly the ground station from the back seat. And so you're like a UAV operator, but you're sitting in the seat. And again, you see this convergence of remote um, uh, human-occupied and autonomous vehicles. Um, so what can we conclude from all this? Um, I'll read a little bit from the conclusion. The fully autonomous lance robot making its way through a landscape under computer control remains an attractive idea for engineers. Perceiving the environment, classifying, matching it up to models and prior experience, and making plans to move forward resemble our daily acts of living. Uncertainties in the world and within the machines, the unexpected that will always foil our prior assumptions make the problem not only harder, but even more interesting. Thinking these problems through, aided by the medium of technology, is a noble effort engineering at its philosophical best. How do we observe, decide, and act in the world? How should we live with uncertainty? But we should not confuse technical thought experiments with what's useful in a human context. When lives and resources are at stake, time and time again, over decades of examples given in this book, from the deep ocean to the outer planets, we have reined in the autonomy. It's not a story about progress, that one day we'll just advance enough to get it right but a story about the move from laboratory and R&D into the field. That transition tempers the autonomy, whether the task is to respond to interactions and return scientific data or to protect and defend human life. In retrospect, Neil Armstrong's last minute manual intervention, turning off the automation on its moon, his moon landing, signaled the limits of the 20th century vision of full autonomy and foretold the slow advent of potent human collaboration and presence. The lone autonomous drone is as much an anachronism as the lone unconnected computer. The challenges of robotics in the 20th century are those of situating machines within human and social systems. They're challenges of relationships. So I'll just close uh, with a little startup that I've been working on called Humatics. Uh, which aims to take what we've done in those two projects for ONR and DARPA and bring them to a larger world of robotics. How do we enable robotics and autonomous systems to work within human environments? 
Um, and how do we make autonomy transparent, trusted, and by extension, safe and useful for people where other people are around? Um, I often say, if you look at the, the full autonomy problem in aviation, build a fully unmanned aircraft to take off, fly somewhere, and land, we solved that problem 20 years ago. We know how to do that. To do that same task from an airport that other people are using, through airspace that other people are flying through, over places where people are living, landing at another airport that other people are using, we're just beginning to think about that problem. That's a very challenging problem that we really don't even have answers to yet. So um, I'll just leave it at that, and there's a bunch of books out there, and we have some time for questions. Thank you. So I'm really interested in the, the failure modes between, as the autonomy is transitioning between, I think the Air France example is a great one. Yep. So you, you put all these safety modes as we're now putting them in cars to pre prevent crashes, and over the statistics, they're safer, but then you, you start to see these really catastrophic failures when, right. when they don't work. So how do we prevent those? How do we keep people, how do we keep the pilots having context when the autopilot says, I need to shut off now and you're in control? Like it's in, it's in, your, in your lap. Um, great we, question. Obviously, yeah. really essential issue. I talk a lot about the Air France crash because it's the, the sort of the classic handoff tragedy. Um, First of all, you can look into that story and you can see that there are things that the, uh, that the airliner could have been programmed to do to make the transition smoother. For example, um, you know, it lost its air data from the pitot tubes when they iced over and uh, at that point just checked out. Said, okay, no more fly-by-wire at all. You're in a manual reversion mode. Here you go, right? Um, but, you know, Again, if you think about engineering the relationship, which wasn't really done when that airliner was designed, um, you can think about a lot of alternatives. You know, anybody who, who programs flight controls for UAVs will tell you that you can fly perfectly flying without pitot tubes, right? Um, you have a sort of basic internal flight model. You knew you were going at a certain rate. It's perfectly capable of holding the airplane stable for a while, quite a while actually, or descending to a safe altitude while the crew can sort of um, secondly, the interfaces on airliners are really not all that well designed by modern standards and they're designed to kind of um, shift liability as much as they are to <laughs> provide I insight into what's going on inside the system. Um, thirdly, and this has come up quite a bit since that crash and a couple other crashes as well, the pilot's manual skills had clearly degraded. I mean, flying an airliner at a very high altitude off an autopilot is not an easy task. The air is very thin. The line between um, stalling and overspeeding is a very narrow line. It's not something that's typically done. Um, at the same time, every beginner pilot is taught when the airplane is stalling, don't pull the stick back. And in the Air France case, one guy pulled it back and one guy pushed it forward. Um, so the handoff is challenging. Um, there are a lot of places that it's done well. Um, there are other places that it's done poorly. There's certainly room for innovation there. In fact, I, I think Again, if we see the, the, the perfect five as a, as a goal of the technology, then we should focus on improving the handoffs in lots of different directions. Um, one of the goals of the book is to at least point out places in, that it's happened in these other cases that are useful examples for people who are working in other technologies today. So uh, absolutely essential thing. So it's not a huge technical leap to go from the assisted helicopter, for instance, landing at the, you know, according to the, the human supervision to adding forward-looking infrared and a minigun to uh, start blasting anything with heat. Mm -hmm. um, are there things that can be done to, you know, prevent, prevent that or prevent the, the evil genius or the uh, little subshot of, I, of CIA from uh, mm -hmm. developing these technologies that really technically aren't that difficult after these other problems are solved. Right, that, that's a great question too. Um, you know, in the current U.S. military official policy is we don't do that, right? Weapons are always released under some kind of human approval process. And, and I think, if anything, I would almost guess that that policy will become stronger because there's a fear among general military professionals, like, what do we actually do, right? If, Actually, joysticking the aircraft maybe isn't our great skill anymore, and we're getting kind of 
pushed around in the networks. Well, deciding who to kill and when, that's an important thing. Um, that said, you know, there's a long history of autonomy in weapons, and a guided missile from the 1950s is, again, a kind of situated autonomy where a human aims a device and releases it, and it has some sort of automatic function. And the debates are really about what is an appropriate and acceptable line for those things. Landmines are autonomous vehicles, right? And they're autonomous weapons without a lot of discrimination. And, and you know, a lot of people feel they're beyond an ethical line that's acceptable. So um, some of these issues are, have a, a long rooting in other questions about weapons. Um, you know, I, I, I personally feel you're a lot more likely to get killed by a poorly designed robot than you are to get killed by an evil robot. Um, and the kind of poor design and poor situating is really a much more immediate concern for us, a la Air France or other things, than, you know, the evil robots coming to take over. I guess maybe a little bit of a follow-up um, on the Air France, except on the ground. I mean, there's a lot of work and a lot of press lately about the development of these autonomous vehicles, the self-driving cars. Mm -hmm. and. I was wondering if you have any comments or ideas of how you think that's going to go or how you think it should develop. Yeah, great question. And I do, I do discuss this in the book. Um, I believe that we should be able to improve the safety of automobiles and even radically change the driver experience using all the good stuff that you've read about, machine vision and LIDARs, other kinds of advanced sensors, path planning. Um, but I think it should be organized around keeping the human deeply involved in the experience. Reducing workload, yes. Allowing you to text, yes. Um, uh, allowing, uh, you know, um, relief of boring activities like sitting in traffic jams, by all means. Um, sleeping in the trunk, no. Um, <laughs> and sleeping in the trunk with your kids in the back seat, you know, it's, again, there are 30 or 40 examples about how that's really not a safe way to think about a system. Um, it's a very interesting, very important debate. As you know, in the last week since the book came out, Tesla released one of its early um, uh, autopilot features. And um, uh, a lot of people feel released it without the proper, I mean, Beta testing is not something you really do with your users when they're going down the highway <laughs> at 90 miles an hour. It's very different from software in other realms. Um, and there's some interesting stuff popping up about various ways that the, um, uh, that there are problems potentially with that algorithm. I think that particular issue has more to do with software testing and release policy than it does with what's the right way to automate the vehicle, but it's still very much on people's minds. Um, and uh, I know there are people in the driverless car community who are horrified and they, you know, I mean, I, and I, I think they're right that if there's an accident in the next week or two with this early release of that software, it'll set back a lot of people's idea of progress for a long time. Um, that said, I think it's amazing and exciting to think about how can we use technology and driving to expand your experience of the world and bring you more richly out into the environment that you're in whether it's your situatedness vis-a-vis -vis other people or the geographic environment or other parts of the driving task, while at the same time relieving you of, I'm a pilot, right, I, and I fly long distances in my plane, but I can mostly do it like this, where my hands are crossed and I'm looking and things don't change all that fast, unless there's a small number of emergencies. Whereas when I drive, I'm, you know, got my shoulders tensed up and a cat or a kid could run out in front of you any moment, that's a much more kind of tense experience. I think there's any, every reason to believe we can relieve that kind of hyperactive nervousness of driving um, into things that will both reduce error, reduce fatigue, reduce workload. Um, but again, I have a lot of trouble imagining sleeping in the back of the trunk um, while the car is barreling down the highway. Well, so I'm wondering, is, is there likely a human factors part? Because in one of the issues with some of the autopods when they take out is that the highly trained pilots have trouble, you know, figuring out how to move into the mode of flying. And is that going to be a problem, particularly uh, with there's drivers? There's certainly, you, you get manual skill degradation <laughs> if, you, if you don't practice it. 
enough and something to certainly consider. Although, again, when you're in a fly-by-wire world, the manual skills are things that you can kind of construct technically. Um, there's nothing that says that this has to be how you drive a car, right? Why? I mean, people have been trying these things for decades, but two joysticks down at near your, your waist uh, is a possible way you could drive the car. That's actually how they flew the lunar module. Um, and, you know, interfaces need to be designed well. There's always challenges with uh, human factors issues. The regulatory environment is challenging. Um, um, but it's very hard to picture a fully autonomous car that doesn't have a red stop button or at least some kind of intervention. Um, and, and if you think about what that constitutes, okay, it constitutes the say, saying that the, the driving task has been in, understood completely in some prior space and time by other people. And there's no possibility that you being in the environment at the particular time have nothing to add to the story, right? That's just something we know is not true, right? Because being there and being the most immediate person and the one with your rear end on the line um, provides you with information that, you know, the system may benefit from. Um, and uh, so there are other ways to think about how you might do that. Hi. Um, so if I was half my age and entering college, what field of study should I go into if I'm interested in um, robotics and this field? Is it more software these days, or is there still a lot of hardware or a combination? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I mean, obviously, the software is critical and exciting and interesting. Um, and at the same time, you know, uh, all of these problems actually point to improvements in sensors that are needed. Um, that you might not even see if you weren't thinking about them in this way. Um, that's one of the things Humatics is going to do is build new kinds of sensors that enable autonomous systems to work in closer proximity to human environments. So, I mean, I'm an electrical engineer. I like building embedded systems and I do some of both, but I, I do think that the hardware innovation is equally interesting to the software innovation. I mean, I think on the, just the autonomous car side, as much at Google as anywhere else, there's been amazing improvement in LiDAR and bringing the cost down simply because of the needs that driving has presented and, and, and LiDAR has limits, so there are other systems that are gonna come out as well. So um, I don't know that it breaks down either hardware or software per se. Um, I do think that um, all of those innovations kind of need to be coupled with these higher level system configurations. And one of the things that was really important to me in the ACUS helicopter program was that what I'm talking about is not just an interface issue, right? Yes, we need better interfaces. Yes, we need good interfaces. And, uh, but no amount of good interface is going to put a Band-Aid on a system that behaves unpredictably or in ways that people can't relate to. It's really about how you design the system and kind of conceptualize the core autonomy. So I was, um, you were talking about the, the self-piloting cars and how you would never be comfortable without having a button in your, a big red stop button in your car. Mm -hmm. But my reality, and I, that would be very nice. I, I like that button. But what I really want is a button, a stop button in everybody else's car. <laughs> <laughs> that you can stop? That I can that, stop. So, yeah. you know, if a car comes barreling down the road with some crazy driver, and I, and I cannot react in a way that will save me right. uh, in, inside of my vehicle for that vehicle to stop. Like yeah, that's, that's really my greater fear when I drive around Los Angeles is not the software or even like my own reactions, but just like the crazy things that sometimes happen. Yep, that's certainly true. In and, LA and all the no, time. No matter what car you make with no matter what technology, at some level you're only going to eliminate half the accidents, which are the ones where you run into other people. And it's, I mean, mo a lot of accidents are people running into things, actually. So, sure. I mean, you know, well, another like, way. You can't to, stop the wall, but. <laughs> right. Well, but another way to say it is. You can build a car that won't hit anything, right? Mm -hmm. And if you build a car that won't hit anything, that doesn't mean it needs to be fully autonomous. Um, it, right. can, it can sort of do collision avoidance or collision prevention. It's probably never going to be perfect, but there are, th I mean, my, my Volvo right now will slam on the brakes if I rear end someone. Sure. Um, uh, but my question is, 
one thing that technology can really do is it can actually it has these communication protocols that mm -hmm. are much faster than the ways humans can communicate. Right. So there is a way using software, using robots to make the driving experience in this case considerably safer yeah. by ensuring other people won't hate you. Well, I, I, And I, I, that's something that I think, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Yeah, no, it's fine. It's something that is really absent from this discussion right mm -hmm. now of all these extra safety of all this extra safety potential of autonomous decision making. So yeah. how do you think we can change that conversation? Well, I think that's a great point. And again, I think, you know, you have to think about the autonomy as situated in a human setting. That means other cars, other drivers, with their pluses and minuses as operators. Um, and uh, thinking about those relationships, whether it's V2V communications or you know, radar sensors or ultrasonic sensors or whatever um, are all things you, you do need to think about. I doubt we'll achieve perfection in any of them, but I think there's some low-hanging fruit probably that can be addressed, so uh, by all means. Well, um, thank you. You know, might you like to know if the person you're, who's behind you on the highway has a history of drunk driving convictions, right? Yeah, I would like to know that, but there, there are kind of privacy and equity issues around that kind of thing. Um. So I have a quick question that's related to the handoff issue. Mm -hmm. um, it seems like to make that, that handoff, whether it's planned or emergency, mm -hmm. it, safe, mm -hmm. you're going to have to build up some kind of model of whether to believe and trust the user, the actual human input or not, which strikes me as problematic. Like for. In a self-driving car situation, if the if something strange happens, handoff occurs, user is maybe not paying attention and does something like slam on the brake in an unsafe way or swerve in an unsafe way, mm -hmm. at a certain point, the machine is going to have to decide, no, I don't trust you. Um, is, is that problematic? Uh, it is, actually. It's an old question. They asked this question about the Apollo computer. They asked it about an Airbus airliner. Should the computer allow the person to do something dangerous? Right, it's a great question, really interesting right. one. And presuming that you know the difference between dangerous and not well, dangerous. Well, exactly. I mean, whole that's whole a human <laughs> judgment. All you're really saying in that case is that I'm shifting the judgment of what's dangerous from the person in the environment to a group of people sitting around the table right. six months before. Uh, and there's good reasons to do that, right? There are people sitting around the table are probably not fatigued. They have a lot more time to deliberate. There's collectively more brain power, so on and so forth. Um, and at the same time, the person who's in there, however drunk or tired or silly they may be, um, are seeing things that you couldn't see otherwise. That's a, just a judgment call, really, that needs to be made. That is being made every time a parameter is set, a threshold is set, um, a configuration file. I actually have a story in, in the book about you know, the configuration file for one of the DARPA Grand Challenge cars, which is a source of a lot of the, you know, it was 1,300 lines long. There were 1,300 parameters that people had to go in and manually set to make <laughs> that thing work. Um, I'm curious what the modern cars are for that. And that's fine, right? And obviously you try to eliminate them and make them more automated, but there's still a lot of tweaking and setting that goes on inside any kind of AI system these days. And those judgments should be, transparent and understood who's making them why for what reason. That goes, gets as simple as when you drive to the grocery store, do you want to prioritize speed of travel, fuel efficiency, or safety, right? Very often those three things are in conflict with each other. Somebody's got to make that decision. I'm just saying it might as well be you rather than somebody behind closed doors. Hi. I have a question regarding the perfect five scenario. Uh -huh. Will this be applicable 20 years down the line, or is it just in the way of uh, incremental development to autonomy? Applicable to? 20 years down the line, will perfect five would still be your? Uh, yeah, I do scenario? actually don't think, I mean, again, all the evidence you've seen in the last 50 years is that systems that get deployed where there are lives at stake end up in that state. Okay, so it's an empirical argument based on many, many systems studies, basically. Um, you know, I could be wrong in 20 years. Um, I don't, things, I mean, if you had told someone in 1960 that they could make a computer with, you know, a 10 megahertz clock rate and all of, 
you know, three megabytes of RAM, they would have said, of course, that'll be plenty to get us, you know, fully autonomous ships. Um, and indeed that happened and computers have done all kinds of amazing things, but there are still human interventions in all of these systems. So, um, you know, I, I could be proven wrong, but it is an empirical argument based on how people have done this for many previous decades. But incrementally, wouldn't human intervention would be like, uh, we would kind of forget the basics even like, I came to US two years back and now I can't drive stick. Mm -hmm. So incrementally when all these things are getting added, now all these semi-autonomous cars are here and then I, I might just forget the very basics of uh, Having yeah, that intervention, no, I mean, right? and again, these things all go on, right? And ditto with uh, any lock brakes. I'm sure none of you ever have to stop on ice, but from where I come from, we all break on ice all the time. Um, and uh, you have to change the way that you use the brakes, actually, when you have that. That's, there are all these little forms of autonomy that come up from the ground up. But I would argue they're still sort of managed by the user. And um, in fact, your car still has a low gear one and a low gear two. I don't know if all cars have that, but most cars have that. And so you have the automatic mode, and then for whatever reasons, again in snow sometimes there are reasons, um, you can go into those low gears. So you're still in this, con you still have a gear shift in the car, interestingly enough. Thank you. Great, Thank thanks you. for your attention.